Although Nietzsche ultimately wants to defend a philosophy which might be called the joy of life, it is absolutely essential from his very first works that tragedy play a prominent part. Joy of life, tragedy are not opposites, but rather they're mutually necessary. And what we'd like to do in this lecture is to talk about the role of tragedy and the nature of tragedy in life. Nietzsche accomplishes um, really quite a lot in his first book. In a sense, he lays out an agenda that's going to continue with him throughout his entire uh, philosophical production. And the question he asks really is, what was Greek tragedy all about? He ponders the fact that the Greeks seemed so obsessed with the kinds of stories, tragedies included, some of the ones that Bob was talking about last time. And he ends up answering the question, pointing out that the Greeks were not only attempting a ty type of artistic reconciliation of opposites, but actually a kind of solution to the problem of evil. The problem of evil is a traditional religious problem. The problem of could the world be good, or perhaps could the world be the production of a good God, if indeed suffering exists, and we know it does. What Nietzsche thinks the Greeks achieved in their tragedy was to provide a kind of answer that made sense to them. Actually, in raising this question, he follows his mentor Schopenhauer, who, as we've pointed out, thought that the world basically wasn't good, that life was essentially suffering. This, in fact, is a Buddhistic theme in Schopenhauer's thought, which we'll be talking about more in the following lecture. But at any rate, Schopenhauer's conviction was that if you look at the evil around one, the most obvious thing to do is to withdraw from life. And this is what Nietzsche thinks the Greeks were grappling with, too. They, too, recognized that much about life, really on the surface of it, seems rather unacceptable. They had a particular myth that Nietzsche draws attention to early in The Birth of Tragedy, the story of a demigod named Silenus, who was captured and, uh, in, and told to answer a question. And he said that he would, and the question was, what is the best thing for man? At this, Silenus laughed and said, the best thing for man, after all, is not to be born at all, but the second best is to die soon. Nietzsche thought that this was, in a sense, a counterpart to the sort of philosophy that Schopenhauer had been teaching, that you really can't win in this world. The best thing to do is to be as calm as possible and live through it. And what Nietzsche sees the Greeks as doing is dealing with this question in Greek tragedy, but not drawing the Schopenhauerian conclusion. Rather than concluding that what we ought to do is withdraw, um, tune out from life as much as we possibly can, the Greek tragedy actually showed a way of celebrating life, even despite the fact that suffering was an essential part of it. The two principles that Bob mentioned in the previous lecture, the Dionysian and the Apollonian, as Nietzsche initially discusses them, turn out to be two artistic principles. Nietzsche considers two different kinds of art forms, both very popular in his own time, the Romantic era. One art form, that of the visual arts, and as he sees it, particularly the art of sculpture, shows the world in a beautified form. It idealizes the appearances of things. It makes things look more beautiful than they are. But it tries to represent the world very clearly, with clear boundaries with separate individuals, separate entities, that we can appreciate contemplatively. In this, he follows both Schopenhauer and Kant in seeing beautiful images in art as a kind of way for human beings to focus on something in their world and merely enjoy them, merely enjoy contemplating them, not relating to them practically. If you enjoy an artwork that depicts something artistically, it's not a question of, seeing something in the picture that you'd like to own, or being motivated, um, for instance, if it's a still life, to want to get some food that looks as delicious as that on the painting. But instead, ideally, when you view it as art, what you're trying to do is simply contemplate the beauty of form. By contrast, the Dionysian art that Nietzsche talks about is the art of music. And there, the natural response is something quite different. Rather than simply contemplating, music incites you to be part of something. Um, Nietzsche points out in one of his later works, Twilight of the Idols, that it's actually been quite an achievement for human beings to learn to sit still in concert halls, 
because music urges us to move, to use our whole bodies as a kind of symbolic response to this inciting element of music. So when the Greeks merge the two, as Nietzsche claims they do in tragedy, they're in a sense merging two very different ways of looking at the external world. One, the Apollonian way of seeing beauty, idealizing what one sees, and contemplating it, taking satisfaction in it just being what it is, um, and viewing it from a detached point of view, and by contrast, the more musical side of things, the Dionysian, which urges you to respond in as lively a way as the music itself exists. So how do these work together in Greek tragedy? Nietzsche notes the rather interesting historical fact that the Greek tragedy actually began with the chorus alone. For most of modern audiences, I think this comes as a bit of a surprise, since it seems that oftentimes in productions of Greek tragedy, the chorus comes on and comments on what's been going on in the play, but almost seems dispensable. Uh, we tend to be following the plot, and they kind of hamper the plots moving forward, though they comment on it, um, sort of urging us, maybe baiting us to want the plot to go forward. Nietzsche explains that in origin, tragedy had a very, very different structure. Originally, all there was was the chorus. The chorus was essentially a group of supposed half-men, half-beasts, satyrs, who would come on stage and create a kind of musical stir. They'd stir themselves into a kind of frenzied state. And ideally, what would happen is that the audience would also get into this musical um, situation. In a sense, it was almost comparable to a rock concert, a very successful rock concert, in which the whole audience eventually feels like standing up and moving around, um, hopefully not too violently, in response to music that's just captivated them. Originally, the Greek tragic performances were simply this. The satyrs would come on stage, their poetry, and particularly their musical rendition of the poetry, would stir the audiences so much that they were in a position to actually think about the Greek myth. And in a sense, the whole idea of a plot stemmed from already being in a state of mind where one could concentrate on the myth. Originally, an actor appeared on stage as a representative of the god, the god Dionysus. And when the actor appeared on stage, assuming that people actually had been captivated by the chorus, the audience didn't see simply an actor with a mask on. Instead, they, they saw the god himself. Nietzsche's explanation of further elaboration of Greek tragedy was simply further elaboration that of stories that were consistent with the ideal of Dionysus. And we should go back again to explain exactly what this ideal was. It's a kind of sense of frenzied involvement in life. As Nietzsche describes it, uh, particularly as its way of answering the problem of evil, it's the sense that participating in life is intrinsically pleasurable and powerful, that it simply is joyous to be alive, and that that's a much more fundamental insight than any awareness of evil, any awareness of the vulner vulnerability we all face as individuals. So it already, as, as the audience um, approached the arrival of the hero, when there were actors on stage, it was already captivated by this musical state of mind. It was ready for a kind of transformation. In fact, it had already been transformed. People walk into the theater, and Nietzsche says, in their usual roles, um, judges or judges, workmen or workmen, and so on. But as soon as they become part of the audience and part of this Dionysian captivated crowd, all of these roles fall aside. They're simply part of this joyous, frenzied throng that's now capable of the true vision of the tragedy, the arrival of the god on stage. Why Dionysus represents a kind of god that's in opposition to individuality stems from a detail of the myth, at least in one of the tellings. And this story is the story of how Dionysus was ripped to pieces by the Titans, and that his worshipers um, were always looking for a regeneration of Dionysus, his recomposition from the parts that had been torn asunder. And in a sense, this was a kind of symbolic vision of what humanity was like, that human individuals seem so separate from each other, 
but that this was really ultimately illusory and that despite our rather natural tendency to think of our private egos as real, the real solution to this was recognition of our oneness, our oneness through Dionysus. So what the Greek tragic play did was allow people an insight into something about themselves. Certainly the reason that the kinds of plots that became um, common, fair, in Greek tragedy were so interesting was because they are plots about individual vulnerability. But by, ver by raising these very cases, um, it raised the need in the audience to somehow resolve that. And the resolution was something they were in a state of mind to be prepared for because the chorus had made them feel a kind of vitality, a vitality with the whole environment and with everyone around them. At that point, they could turn to this Dionysian resolution, namely the arrival of the god on stage, the reminder that this separation, this vulnerability, only sees the individuated aspect of us and doesn't recognize that, in a sense, at our death, when life goes on, we go on with it. If the earlier Greeks did accept suffering as an inevitable part of life, in fact as an essential aspect of life, the later Greeks, and in particular Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, did not. I've already talked briefly about Socrates and Plato and how in their formulation of the idea of an eternal soul, of a world that's more perfect than this one, they rationalized tragedy by saying, in effect, this suffering, this life, don't worry about it because there's something better to come, something which clearly anticipates Christianity. But the third member of that triad is someone I haven't talked about and someone who in this context is actually extremely interesting. In fact, Aristotle has the well-deserved reputation as the theorist of tragedy. He didn't, as far as we know, write any tragedies, but he certainly wrote the definitive book of ancient world, the Poetics, in which he discusses what tragedy is, what's a good tragedy, what makes it work, and essentially lays out a whole system of rules which explain to potential playwrights the form that they should follow. What's interesting philosophically about Aristotle in this context is, first of all, that Aristotle, unlike Socrates and Plato, who was his teacher after all, Aristotle did not accept the idea of another world. In fact, you may know a very famous painting in the Vatican by Raphael called The School of Athens. And inside the central arch is a depiction of Plato and Aristotle. And Plato, the older man, has his finger raised towards the heavens. And Aristotle, in a very distinctive gesture, is pushing downward, emphasizing this world. So Aristotle, in one sense, is very interestingly on Nietzsche's side. In fact, one can hypothesize why Nietzsche doesn't talk more about Aristotle, who is also, interest, also very similar to him in ethics. And one hypothesis is because Aristotle was still associated very much with Aquinas and Catholicism. But Aristotle himself, in addition to being very this-worldly, as Nietzsche was, also thought about tragedy in a very specific and now well-established way. And let me use Oedipus as an example. One of Aristotle's theses, or by no means the major one, is that in tragedy, although we're dealing with a noble character, a king, a queen, someone of extremely high status typically, nevertheless, the character has a tragic flaw. And the tragic flaw theory has been embellished in many different ways over the years. Of course, Christianity picks it up and runs with it. Original sin is one way of talking about it for everyone. But also the very notion that sins committed while you are alive can jeopardize your chance for immortal happiness, that's very much part of the same kind of thesis. In Aristotle, it's more modest, but nevertheless, it's very significant. Take Oedipus. Oedipus, as I suggested in an earlier lecture, was a good man. If you think about the criteria for virtue, for integrity, he had it. He answered the riddle of the Sphinx and he saved the city. He went on to become king. We know that he heard the myth, the rumor, about himself and 
ran away from home, essentially, to avoid harming his parents. Nevertheless, fate caught up with him, and he did so. It is Oedipus who drives the play. The play, in fact, is set during a period of pestilence in which, Aris, in which Oedipus is trying to figure out its cause. And even though Tiresias, the seer, the sage, warns him in no uncertain but still subtle terms that he shouldn't pursue this line of questioning, Oedipus proceeds and insists until finally, of course, he discovers what the cause of the pestilence is, namely himself and his own actions. With this, it is often interpreted that Oedipus, in fact, is flawed. He's proud, he's arrogant, he's stubborn. Against this, one can say very quickly, he's king, of course, that's the way kings are. As for stubbornness, isn't this just another name for what we call integrity? Now, the interesting question is, why is it so important to find this tragic flaw? And I think the answer is very revealing. Because insofar as we can watch a tragedy, and we can, at a distance, a safe distance, empathize with the hero, and say how terrible, and feel the kind of fear and anguish that Aristotle describes, we also feel it's not going to happen to us. Because, Arist because Oedipus is different. He's king. He's in a situation that we won't be in. He's facing a dilemma that we won't have to face. And he's flawed. You may have noticed yourself, I find myself doing this all the time, and I hate it. And I can imagine Nietzsche having the same reaction. But there's an earthquake, or a flood, or some terrible tragedy, somewhere in the world. And my rationalization, before I have a chance to think about it, is... Well, it's not me, and it wouldn't be me, because I'm not. I'm not Chinese. I'm not living in the Middle East. I'm not living over the San Andreas Fault. I'm not living in a floodplain. Or, closer to home. Well, the flight was Delta. I fly American. But there's always the sense, it's not me. I'm not in the class of tragic figures. So there's a sense in which Aristotle, in a much more subtle way, allows us to rationalize tragedy. And he does it by saying, insofar as we can find something that's significantly different about the tragic figure, that's enough for us to distance ourselves and to fool ourselves into thinking, that's not going to happen to me. What we do is we seek a safe respite in Socrates and Plato, in another world, in Aristotle, in a much more sophisticated mode of rationalization. Nevertheless, the upshot of this, of course, is to try to explain tragedy, to rationalize it away, and nowhere is this more concrete and, for Nietzsche, more prone to attack than in Christianity itself. Of course, for Nietzsche, Christianity is, in a sense, following the model of Plato. Um, in fact, at one point he calls it Platonism for the masses. And what he has in mind here is the idea that what you do to explain what seems inexplicable in this world is make reference to another. So if some tragedy befalls someone, especially someone that we don't see as particularly guilty, one of the con common responses in the Christian tradition is, God has a plan, God sees things we don't, um, therefore somehow it's rational or rationalizable. It's something we don't have to worry about. This is God's business. Not, I think, that this always cheers people up, um, though it's supposed to. But I think what Nietzsche sees in it is something that's um, even more dubious than something that fails as um, encouragement. Namely, the fact that if you're really looking for something that rationalizes terrible things that happen to people, in a sense, you're not taking the tragic feature of it seriously. It's almost as if God is pictured as a kind of um, super accountant who has some kind of equation in which the correct solution comes out happening. That somehow it's worth the expense of all these people suffering in order to bring about some greater good in the end. I think Nietzsche's reaction to that is that it's appalling to think anyone would find this cheering. Um, indeed, this is a rather monstrous way of interpreting God's intentions. 
that God doesn't care about a lot of people, um, factors them in as part of his ultimate plan, and in a sense, that makes their sufferings not really so important. Um, they're only part of this world. They're not, in a sense, in the fundamental picture, all that significant. Nietzsche thinks the Greeks, in a sense, were facing reality more than at least much of Christian thought in resolving the problem of evil, precisely because they didn't try to white whitewash or eliminate the significance of real human suffering. There was a kind of willingness to just stare suffering in the face. He thought the Greeks quite reasonably thought it was important to look at what was beautiful around one as well. So one didn't dwell on the tragic all the time. But nevertheless, to acknowledge that tragedy exists, that there are some things that aren't rational and are not even rationalizable that happen to people is simply to accept some of the conditions of life. The Greek resolution wasn't to say, in some other plane, this will all make sense, at least not the Greeks that Nietzsche um, viewed as heroes. Socrates and Plato, maybe from that point of view, are not the Greeks that Nietzsche loved. But to, to view this as something that can be rationalized by turning to another plane is exactly what the ancient Greeks, the pre-Socratic Greeks, didn't do. What they did instead was to say, this is real, this is something we all face, and nevertheless, life is so fundamentally good that we're all worth, we find this all worthwhile. Um, this is well worth the price of admission for each of us. We can't make this make sense. Nevertheless, we live on and we live joyously. It's important not to think about tragedy just as theater, although clearly that's part of what Nietzsche is talking about. And it's important not to think about tragedy in life as just bad things happening to good people. That that, that happens is obvious enough. But that's really not what this discussion is about. Tragedy is a certain kind of perspective. And for Nietzsche, it carries with it a certain sense of nobility. Not necessarily that one is a king or a queen or royalty in any sense. But there's a kind of noble attitude towards life and a noble kind of acceptance. In fact, several ways of thinking about this. And all of it is a certain kind of perspective which has to be distinguished from the various Christian and rationalistic perspectives that we've been talking about. One figure who plays a major role here, although Nietzsche talks surprisingly little about him, I think one has to surmise that Nietzsche really didn't know that much about him, and also he was under the spell of a, a shadow. The figure is Hegel, who is somebody I've mentioned before, an early, very important 19th century philosopher who had a, really a theory of the universe. And it's one of those grand philosophical perspectives that would be worth 24 lectures all by itself. But the main point is that Hegel saw tragedy not as the sort of payment for a flaw, much less as something which could be overseen by appeal to another world. Hegel, although he was being interpreted at the time, and this is why I think Nietzsche didn't pay much attention to him, as a religious thinker, Hegel, in fact, was a very this-worldly thinker for whom spirituality was a this-worldly phenomenon and for whom God, insofar as one wanted to talk about God in this context at all, was not separate and different from the creation. Hegel's theory of tragedy, consequently, is, like the early Greeks, a kind of suprapersonal view, that we can view ourselves as individuals, but to do so, Hegel says, is kind of illusory. Not that he rejects it. It's an important part of modern civil society. It's an important part of our way of understanding ourselves. Nevertheless, ultimately, we are all one. It's a view that Hegel certainly shares with the ancient Buddhists and Hindus, although he explicitly rejects them because he wants to appear as a Christian. It's something he shares with Schopenhauer, which is something we'll talk about next time. But the view that we're all, all ultimately one goes straight back to the Dionysian myth and the idea that although we think of ourselves as separate pieces, separate individuals, the truth is that we only make sense as a unity. Nevertheless, within that unity, there are very different forces. It's Hegel who makes famous the notion of dialectic, of course, it's a Greek notion. Basically, it means conversation, a back and forth. Uh, 
And one finds it most notably in Plato's dialogues with Socrates. But for Hegel, dialectic is a kind of historical movement. And what defines human consciousness, what defines history, what defines the history of religion, the history of philosophy, is a kind of struggle back and forth. In other words, Nietzsche's notion of the Greek agonistic society. For Hegel, history consists of such warring forces, which he says, with progress, with the evolution of what he calls spirit, will eventually resolve themselves into a sense of mutual, all-embracing understanding. Within that picture, the way to understand tragedy is not, as Aristotle said, to look for the tragic flaw in the tragic hero, but the way to understand tragedy is rather to see that people get caught, that individuals can sometimes be caught in these movements, these conflicting forces, and the result is tragedy for them, but in a way a step forward for humanity. Hegel's favorite, uh, favorite tragedy, accordingly, is not Oedipus so much as Antigone, because Antigone is the classic play, which presents a young woman who is caught and has to make a terrible choice. On the one hand, there is the whole of what Hegel refers to as the divine law, the law of the family and family obligation. And to obey that law, she has to bury her brother because Greek religion was very clear that if you're unburied, essentially you're damned. On the other hand, the civil leader tells her, you cannot bury your brother. He is not to be given that kind of religious sanction. And she has a horrible choice. If she obeys the laws of the state, the laws of civil society, then she betrays her brother. If she obeys the family law and buries her brother, she betrays the state. And of course, in the end, she has to die. But the important point is that tragedy is not because Antigone has a flaw. Tragedy is because she's caught at a very critical moment in human history. The time when families and tribes were developing into larger units, what we now call societies, in which the rule was not of the father, but rather the rule was of law. And so tragedy gets explained by appeal to something larger than the individual, but it's not something otherworldly. One thing that's a bit ironic is that um, Hegel has a notion that we're all one, and that's part of the resolution of what seems to be a tension or a, a mystery about why tragedy would appeal and be so important to the Greeks. And that's something that Nietzsche refers to as well. Similarly, Schopenhauer, another person whose theory of tragedy Nietzsche is playing off here, is someone who thinks that fundamentally we're all one. And indeed, in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche acknowledges a debt to Schopenhauer, but nevertheless still wants to move past Schopenhauer's theory. And Schopenhauer's theory, um, at, which we'll talk about in greater detail next time, is a theory that basically sees tragedy as allowing us insight into the importance of compassion, of recognizing that other people are really in the same boat. So although a pessimist, thinking that inevitably there will be conflict, he sees tragedy as something that will bring us to moral insight. Nietzsche thinks, again, to bring someone to moral insight is really to try to make tragedy to seem in some ways less tragic, a means to an end. He wants to draw attention to the way the Greeks saw tragedy as something that has to be encountered and can't be simply explained. And with Nietzsche, of course, ultimately the message is to love life despite suffering. It may be true that tragedy is unavoidable, but nevertheless, tragedy, the very meaning of the word as we're using it here, requires a certain kind of nobility, which means, to a certain extent, a kind of selflessness. Now this runs in a funny way against the rumor that Nietzsche was a defender of selfishness, but nevertheless, as we'll see, these two things actually go hand in hand in a very nice way, because much of what we call selfishness, in fact, isn't selfish at all, and much of what we call selflessness isn't selfless at all. But the basic picture which Nietzsche derives from the Greeks in the Dionysian is that we have to see ourselves not just as individuals, but as part of a larger world. And Nietzsche consequently 
believes in something that hasn't been talked about that much in the last several hundred years, and that's fate. We're all fated, and that is going to define an awful lot of the rest of Nietzsche's philosophy.